Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, military spending and profiting and the United Kingdom in particular, our guest, Dr. Sam Perlow Freeman, is a research coordinator at Campaign Against Arms Trade in the UK, where he has focused on UK military spending and procurement, UK arms sales to Saudi Arabia and the war on Yemen, and global arms trade to countries in conflict. Previously, Sam worked at the World Peace Foundation on corruption in the international arms trade, and before that, at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, researching global military spending, arms trade, and arms production. He's been involved as both a researcher and an activist on arms trade and other peace issues for about 25 years. Sam Perlow Freeman, welcome to Talk World Radio. Hi, David. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming on and thanks for everything you're doing. Um, uh, a lot of things I want to talk about, but there's been a, a recent development that's somewhat encouraging uh, for your ability to go after weapon sales in the UK to Saudi Arabia. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. So, of course, of the many terrible aspects of UK arms trade, the absolute worst at the moment is the continuing export of arms to Saudi Arabia, fighter jets and all the components and support and maintenance for that, and bombs and missiles uh, for Saudi Arabia to use in their brutal, devastating war in Yemen, which, which has, uh, the war has killed over 200 thousand people um, and uh, Saudi led bombing has been the, the cause of, of most direct civilian deaths, well over 8,000 people killed in direct attacks. And the UK has just kept this going. Uh, now, CAT campaign against arms trade took the government to court a few years ago. And in 2019, we won our case that UK the way that the government went about deciding on these arms sales was against the UK's own law on arms exports. So the government had to go back and do their homework and actually look at the evidence of atrocities by Saudi Arabia. And they looked at all these hundreds of allegations, or at least at some of them, and they concluded there was a few isolated incidents of violations, just a small number. We know of hundreds of cases where they've bombed schools, marketplaces, hospitals, mosques, residential areas, agricultural facilities, and they've done it again and again. But all the government could find was some isolated incidents which don't create any risk of future atrocities. Um, and therefore, it's perfectly OK to carry on selling arms to their best customer. So we have to start all the way again from the ground up to take them to court again to say, basically, pardon my language, this is bullshit. We use more formal legal language in the case that we put, and we've just got permission to take this to court. So it's still a long way to go, but the courts are gonna hear our case. They say it's an arguable case. It'll probably be heard next, this year, later this year. Um, and, and we are confident that we will find that the government is still breaking its own laws and that the, the process by which it's making these absurd judgments about what's happening in Yemen is irrational and illegal, as the previous courts found the first time. Uh, very glad to hear it. Very much wish you well on that. It, it seems Thank you. to me that that every recent war in recent decades that I'm aware of has killed primarily civilians by everybody's definition, uh, has bombed villages, cities, towns, etc. What would be an example of a recent war that was proper and legal and in compliance with all the restrictions so that the UK could properly have, have armed that war? There, there are no examples. Um, there's, uh, I mean, it, it's it's no longer the case that it's overwhelmingly civilians that are directly killed. I mean, I think in Yemen, the majority of people killed have been fighters on one side or another. If you're talking about direct deaths, when you talk about the deaths from starvation and disease um, that result from the war, then that's still um, overwhelmingly civilians. But whether you're looking at 
um, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the the wars in um, which, which, of course, the UK has been directly involved in, whether you're looking at wars that the UK is armed, like in Yemen, or even some that the UK actually hasn't armed. We haven't armed all of them, like Armenia and Azerbaijan, or the recent war in Ethiopia, not to a significant extent. None of them have been fought cleanly, if that's even a meaningful thing to say. All of them have involved atrocities. All of them have involved killing of civilians, um, human rights abuses, the use, uh, in, in some cases like Ethiopia, the use and Yemen, the use of starvation as a tool of war, which all sides have been using. There is no such thing as a just war or a morally fought war. And uh, some of them the UK arms, some of them for its own reasons it doesn't, maybe because there's not much money to be made from some of them. Um, but th 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 there's no war where you can say, yes, this is a good war and selling arms to one particular side is supporting the moral side and is going to bring about peace and justice. It just doesn't happen. Well, at least there you can say there are some the UK doesn't arm. I'm not aware of being able to say that with the United States, uh, <laughs> much less being able to identify only one side with US weapons in, in any wars I'm aware of. But uh, you've, you've done some reports on the global arms trade. Uh, it, it seems the arms are all coming from a small number of places and going to a completely different set of places. Is, is that right? Traditionally, it's a fairly small number of producers that the do have dominated the global arms trade, the US, Russia, and some of the big Western European um, producers. But that's been changing. Um, there, there's been a lot of new players who've be been becoming major producers and exporters in the global arms trade. Israel, for example, uh, China has been becoming more and more of an actor. Ukraine, South Korea, they've just shown off their big new advanced fighter jet domestically developed with a lot of US technology and involvement of other countries as well, but actually domestically developed and produced, which they're very keen to sell to whoever wants to buy, except perhaps their neighbours to the north. Um, so, and, and more Western European countries have been developing significant arms export trades. So unfortunately, you can no longer say that it's just a few countries that are selling to the rest of the world. What is true is that um, wherever is, there is a conflict in the world, you will find uh, one or several or very many uh, arms exporters willing to sell to it. And the report that I've just uh, produced a couple of months ago uh, finds that in general, conflict is no deterrent to the exporters, to any of the major exporters. Indeed, some in some cases, it's an incentive to sell arms, but there's no evidence that in general, arms transfers become less likely from any of the big exporters when there's a war on. You mentioned Israel and Ukraine, which may be a bit of exceptions, but other than that, all of the places with the wars, the places we think of as the violent places, aren't really on the list of, of the weapons makers, uh, manufacturers, right? They're getting the weapons from somewhere else. Uh, y yes, indeed. It, uh, the, the wars are mostly not fought uh, where the arms are, are, are produced. Um, I, I mean, of, of course, a lot of the arms producers are involved in wars, virtually all of them. Of the major arms producers, the only one that's not been involved in a war in recent decades is China. And they are hardly a model of respect for human rights. Um, and uh, decent beh human behavior or, or anti-militarism. Um, so uh, yeah, they're involved in wars, but in most cases it's wars uh, far from their own shores.
Right, exactly. It, is the United States still in a strong first place in terms of, of weapons sales and exports? And where, where does the United Kingdom fall in the rankings? Uh, the, the US is first by however you measure it. Um, for for uh, the CIPRI figures on major conventional arms transfers, which is the best way of comparing like with like because ev everyone produces a different sort of data and it's often very dubious, the data that comes out. Uh, so CIPRI, they only cover certain types of weapons and transfers, but they have a common valuation system that allows you to make comparisons. So there, I think it was somewhere between 35 and 40% of the world's arms uh, transfers come from the US, Russia in second, UK only in sixth by that measure. But if you look at the actual money, the UK is second or third, along with uh, close to Russia, because so much of the UK's arms sales revenue come from services. BAE Systems, the biggest UK arms company, has six and a half thousand employees in Saudi Arabia supporting and maintaining and providing um you know repair overhaul training logistics to the saudi air force keeping it in the air keeping it bombing yemen um and that is not one of the things that sipri measures because they're only measuring the sort of major equipment that goes from one place to the other yeah this seems like a big motivation for some of these governments promoting weapon sales from within their countries. It's not just, you know, profits for corporations based there, but it's also the connections uh, so that the, the United States also has people training and maintaining and updating and fixing the weapons that don't actually work uh, in Saudi Arabia and all these other places. So... So when uh, President Biden announces we're going to stop the the offensive attacks on Yemen and the relevant weapon sales, and then all the attacks turn out to be defensive and all the weapon sales turn out to be irrelevant, uh, what you'd actually have to end to get the U.S. out of the war on Yemen would include maintaining and, and training and aiding the Saudis in using all of their weapons that came from the United States. And, and same for the United Kingdom, right? Yes, and un unfortunately, that they are not. Uh, they are not doing that. Um, we're not sure which, if any, arms sales that they're going to definitively stop in line with Biden's announcement. Hopefully, um, at least the new sales of munitions, of bombs and missiles that are directly being dropped on Yemen, but. Unfortunately, there's little indication or no indication that they're going to stop all this maintenance and support. And there's this story that they tell, um, and the UK government uh, does as well, but especially the US, there's this big story that this is a wonderful tool of foreign policy. We've got these connections, we've got all these people on the ground, and it gives us influence for good or ill. Um, and but there is, there is no evidence that this influence actually makes any difference to the recipient country's behavior um, in terms of following what the US claims as US values, uh, or even in terms of following US interests, whether, they, whether those interests are think, what we would consider good or bad things in the, in the grander scheme of things. But, this idea that by selling the arms and having the connections that you cause the country to act the way you want it to, there's just no evidence of that. And even some, some pretty right-wing think tanks like the Cato Institute have, uh, have, have, have found this when, that, when they've analyzed the picture across the world. Like if you look at UN votes, it just doesn't make any difference. Yeah. What, what does the public in the United Kingdom think on these issues, if anything? Uh, how much are people aware of the size of the, the weapons and, and war profiteering industry and, and the customers and the role played by their government? I think that uh, arms sales to Saudi and the war in Yemen has been, relatively speaking, quite in the news. So I think a lot of people are aware of it, of, among people who are you know, reasonably aware, aware of what's going on in the world, which is not necessarily the majority. Most people are against arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Um, 
and to a lot of the UK's main customers. Um, but it's not necessarily something that gets talked about a lot or that swings votes. As to how much people know about the size of the arms trade, most people think it's much bigger than it is, um, which is, is maybe surprising. They have this idea that, which the industry, of course, is keen to sell, that it's such an important part of the UK economy. And many people cynically will say, ah, we, the UK, it doesn't produce anything except arms anymore. You know, all our manufacturing has gone to pot, has gone to hell, except the arms industry. And of course, manufacturing has declined, but it's not true. And arms exports are still less than 5% of UK manufacturing exports and the arms and arms exports are less than half a percent of UK GDP. So people imagine that it's much bigger economically than it is. And that's because it's so politically significant to the government. The government regard it as such a key strategic industry that arms trade jobs, a job in the arms trade gets the attention of, 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 of 10 jobs in any other industry in terms of, uh, of how important it's seen by the media and the government. Yeah, I think, that's, uh, I think that happens in the United States as well, even though it's more true here, that, I mean, it's a, it's a bigger uh, industry mm. here, but, but there've been all these studies, uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst has done these studies. Uh, if you put the same money into something else, education, infrastructure, green energy, or even not taxing it from working people in the first place, you'd have more jobs. So yeah. you're actually eliminating jobs. I don't know if there have been similar studies in the UK, and if so, if anybody knows about them. There have not. Um, I suspect you'd get similar results um, because the, uh, the arms industry is so capital intensive. Um, but of course, it's a different setup. You, you have different mix uh, of skills within the industries. You have different profiles of where troops are, like probably more US troops are overseas, which means that more of the, the soldiers wages get spent uh, and, and and also the operational spending gets spent overseas um though there's quite a lot of that for the uk so it, it's it's really it, it's really hard to translate that from one country to another but given that the uk arms industry is very high tech very capital intensive i would suspect that you'd get similar results the UK is also uh, doubling down on on nuclear weapons too, right? While the while the world, as a global trend, is moving toward prohibiting them. Yeah, at, at least that that part of majority of the world that doesn't have nuclear weapons is moving right. towards prohibiting them. Uh, yeah, the, the UK insists basically it will keep nuclear weapons until the last nuke from any other country has been disarmed that will, you know, uh, will be among the absolute last to get rid of ours if, if that ever happens. They say that they eventually want to work towards a world without nuclear weapons, and they're going to do that by building up our nuclear arsenal. Uh, in, they've increased the cap on warheads, which, which is the opposite direction to which most countries with nuclear weapons have been going. At the same time, you know, all, all countries have been uh ad making their weapons more advanced developing more advanced powerful uh stealthier w weapons and so forth uh the uk of course is replacing its current trident submarines with, with a new uh set of uh submarines uh along with the presumably upgraded missiles le le uh, leased from the us it's likely to spend over 200 billion over the lifetime of pounds over the lifetime of the new uh, nuclear weapons program, and yeah, that, that they show no interest in even multilateral disarmament efforts, let alone a, any unilateral efforts by the UK itself. Now, you take people to court for violating laws, and the Treaty on Non-Proliferation is presumably a law and requires moving toward disarmament with all deliberate speed or some such language. Uh, any any chance of, of taking anyone to court on this one? The, the reason we can do our court case on uh, Yemen is that the, the um, 
things that the UK has signed, like the EU Common Position and then later the Arms Trade Treaty, have been written into UK law very specifically. Um, now, aspects of the Non-Proliferation Treaty are certainly in UK export controls, the bits that say you mustn't help anyone else develop nuclear weapons. Um, so there's actually some pretty strong controls on dual-use exports, for example, the sort of stuff that could uh, that can have perfectly legitimate civilian applications but could be used to help a nuclear weapons program. They're actually quite careful about that sort of thing. But the bit about working towards disarmament, that's not written into UK law. Uh, it's just a vague promise, as the UK government would see it, for some time indefinitely in the future. And unfortunately, even though it's in a treaty, that sort of thing, you, you, can't, you can't take to court. You can't... Uh, it, it's not justiciable, and uh, I, I'm afraid that um, the, the, the courts would throw out any attempt uh, to, to do so at the first hurdle. If it was not the case, then CND would have taken them to court a very long time ago. Campaign for nuclear disarmament. Yeah. Um, you, uh, Sam Perlow Freeman, you're going to be facilitating a session at the No War 2021 conference that World Beyond War is planning that, that people can go to worldbeyondwar.org and, and sign up for. Can, can you give mm -hmm. us a bit of a preview what people might be, be doing or, or learning about or working on there? So it's uh, on the, the session that, uh, that I'm involved in is on the need to, um, uh, for conversion to a peace economy. So uh, I, I don't know what all the speakers are going to be talking about and that, I'm, and uh, I'm excited to find out, but I, I think that the, uh, the, the issue here is how much of our economies are devoted directly or indirectly towards promoting militarism, towards promoting war, and um, just as we need to move away from a fossil fuel economy, we need to move away from a war economy to a sustainable peace economy, which uh, invests in things like low carbon technologies and of course healthcare and education that actually promote human life rather than destroy it and that promote international cooperation and well-being uh, rather than promoting international conflict. Uh, and so I, I hope we, we are going to be looking at um, the strategies that campaigners can take to show that this is possi both possible, necessary and desirable to move away from uh, jobs and economies based on building weapons and on uh, fossil fuel extraction, which of course is a major cause of conflict in itself, and that there really are alternatives which can give people um, productive, well-paying jobs that are actually contributing to global peace and global prosperity and well-being rather than the opposite. And are there are there things people can can easily do to to get involved in this in terms of educating others or moving governments and, and institutions globally, nationally, locally uh, toward conversion? I mean, it, it's always a tough one, isn't it? How do you actually change government policy when the government uh, really does not want to change policy? I mean, they know that there's plenty of jobs alternatives, but they value uh, military industries as the source of their military power too much. So, but I think it is true that when you talk about reducing arms production and sales, jobs always comes to mind. So just if people know about the alternatives and know how easy it is for arms workers who are very often highly skilled, highly educated and trained um, uh, workers, uh, to move into these alternative productive uh, industries, to have these opportunities. If people know about those facts uh, and, and just how many potential jobs there are, then, you know, you know it, it's something where the word can gradually be spread. And these myths that are so widely held, even by our supporters, 
like I say, the cynical ones who say, ah, the UK doesn't produce anything else but weapons. We're no good at anything else. It ain't true. There's lots wrong with the UK, but we have a lot of really good high technology industries, which would be even bigger if the government invested in them. So if people just know that these alternatives exist, um, then I think that can that can go a long way. A very good point. Uh, Sam Perlow Freeman, we have just a few minutes left. I've been talking with you for a while. And had I been talking to anyone on this topic from the United States, I would have heard the word defense about five dozen times by now, the defense industry, the defense companies. Is it is it intentional? Is it conscious that you more accurately and correctly and, and usefully use words like military and weapons and war? <laughs> and arms industry yeah we, right. we we don't talk about the defense industry um we we, we think it's a it's a propaganda word uh, and defense generally for the use of military power you know uh sometimes countries are defending themselves but more often than not um when you talk about the uk it's either about intervening militarily somewhere like iraq and afghanistan it's offense or it's just showing off our power and status, flag waving, like we're going to send an aircraft carrier, a strike group to the Pacific. Um, what's it going to do when it gets there? Um, is it going to is it going to scare the Chinese into behaving themselves? Supposedly, I think they're going to laugh at it. It's going to go over there, wave some flags, show that Britain is still a mighty, mighty power, and then come home. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So I don't know if you call that offense or pride or flag waving, but it's certainly not defending anything or anyone. So no, we don't call it defense. I could not agree more. And it may be that mocking it is part of uh, the, the tasks uh, needed uh, for people to work on. Um, I, it, it, just with a minute left, uh, as someone who has some expertise on these issues, I wonder what you would advise people in the United States who always look at these comparisons from CIPRI and elsewhere of military mm -hmm. spending but realize that there's you know another three quarters of a trillion missing in the US total because they've got the military spread across all these departments, uh, the nukes in the energy department, the, the Homeland Security Department, the State Department's doing military stuff, there's the debt for the past wars. Uh, mm. How do I compare the one and a quarter trillion that US total each year with other countries? Yeah, well, um, the CIPRI figures include some things like the Department of Energy nuke spending. Right. Um, it doesn't include things like the debt, but it doesn't include it for any country. So if you were to take that one and a quarter trillion figure, you need to up the figures for a whole lot of other countries as right. well. And no one's, collected, those, right? no one's collected that data. And of course, it would differ uh, for a lot from country to country. But certainly a lot of the homeland security, a lot of the intelligence agency spending almost certainly should be counted. But again, and, and homeland yeah. security, it's just such a massively bigger thing in the US than a lot of places. So China, if you were to count everything that they're doing in Xinjiang uh, the, 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 against the Uyghurs, and the, you, you know, you'd, you'd get a lot bigger figure there as well. So it's really hard to make those comparisons. Yeah, so but, yeah. Very, very, very hard to be continued. Uh, sadly, we're out of minutes. Sam Perlow Freeman uh, is a research coordinator at Campaign Against Arms Trade in the UK. Sam, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. And thank you very much, David, for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.